I want you to notice the date on my Merchant Marine flag, 1775. We were on duty before the, Indo the Declaration of Independence. The ship called the Morro Castle. Some of you people who are old enough might remember this. I remember it when I was a kid. I was 12 years old. This ship caught fire off the coast of New Jersey and destroyed itself. Hundreds of people got killed. There were six lifeboats launched out of 12. 84 people were in the lifeboats and most of them were merchant seamen. Now why was that? Well, was there a lack of training? Why was the ship, why did the ship burn so fast? Probably ship construction at that time was not what it should be. This is the ship as it landed up on the beach in Ashbury Park, New Jersey. Right after England declared war on Germany, Germany just uh, sank the, uh, the British ship Athena. There were 200 and some Americans on this ship, uh, and there were three from Hartford, and uh, they lived, and they managed to escape. After that ship burned, the Merchant Marine Act of 1936 came into being, and the act authorized better ship construction, better safety, better seamen training, especially with lifeboats and how to man, how to man them. It also established the United States Merchant Marine Academy. That's where I graduated in 1945. But when I went to sea, I was a cadet midshipman. Another part of the Merchant Marine Act of 36 was the construction of 50 ships a year. And those ships were going to be the C-1, C-2, and C-3, and the tanker. Now, the, the C-1 was information on the Merchant Marine in World War II. There was only 215,000 Merchant Marine. Uh, we had 6,000 ships, and of course some of them made many trips. We lost 6,834 mariners at sea, casual rate 1 in 30. Merchant Marine ships were sunk 833, and the 640 ships were used in a Normandy invasion. I was working in a defense factory, and I was told that I had a, a wartime deferment. I wouldn't have to go to... I wouldn't have to be uh, drafted in the Army. I wouldn't have to go, because my job was kind of important. I was making the cables that controlled the aircraft. And, uh, but I was working 84 hours a week. Uh, in a month, I worked uh, the complete month from 7 to 7, or 7 to 7. My friend and uh, my partner and I relieved each other on four stranding machines making cable. For a whole month, we relieved each other morning and night, 12 hours a day. I got paid for 106 hours a week. Uh, and we did it for a whole month, and then we changed shifts to, uh, but anyway, I didn't want to talk about that anymore. But anyway, I got sick of that. I saw the ad, I want you, so I, I succumbed. <laughs> and I went into Merchant Marine. There I am, 20-year-old 20 20, 20 skinny kid. <laughs> The armed guard for the Merchant Marine should be recognized. They're out there with the Merchant Marine ships all the time. And during convoy duty up in the North Atlantic, they were indispensable with communications. And uh, of course, they have the guns, but they don't get to use them up in the North Atlantic. But uh, they're in, in, very important. And I do want to recognize them. And one other thing, the Merchant Marine is also up in the Great Lakes. And when you think about all the iron ore they brought down from Minnesota, hundreds of thousands of tons of steel or uh, iron ore for Pittsburgh, that's why we were able to make the Merchant Marine. They needed merchant seamen and they needed them fast. They had ads for, for merchant, old Merchant Marine, old Merchant Mariners to come and serve the Merchant Marine, and they got some. They got some that was 70 years old. Even with one leg, you could get an emergency marine. You could get an emergency marine where you could never get in the army. And everybody in the emergency marine was a volunteer. There was no draftees. This is the emergency marine uh, training center down in Brooklyn, New York. The emergency marine training center was started just a couple months after uh, Pearl Harbor, and uh, it could train 30,000 seamen a year. And it was built in. Uh, starting in January, February, and it was completed in September. So they received the, the first recruits in training, and they were out to sea in December of that year. And they had to do this because the merchant ships were coming off the, the shipways by uh, hundreds, 
and they need merchant seamen. This right here is a mock-up of a rivering ship. All, all of the uh, upper deck parts of a rivering ship were there for men to be trained on. So when they left Sheepshead Bay, this is all Sheepshead Bay, when they left Sheepshead Bay, they would be more or less acquainted with what their, what their job was going to be. Now right here, all these little round things are where men were trained to steer a ship, be a helmsman in other words. This is the Liberty Ship Engine, 140 tons, was 19 feet high, about 19 feet long, and uh, that's what I was trained on when I went to Sheepshead Bay before I get, got to go to the academy. It was produced in 19 different factories. One of the factories was right here in New England, in, I think it was in Springfield. Now this is a picture of a young man learning how to feel the, the crankshaft with his hands to see if it's hot. <laughs> if it's hot, you had to oil it by hand. Now you had automatic boilers, but you had to check it every day, uh, many times, to see if the bearings were getting hot. And if they were, you oil it by hand with an oil can. How would you like to oil that thing? Those big pieces of machinery, you have to go right inside the machine to do this. And you have to get the rhythm of the machine when 70, 70 RPMs, and you try to hit the spot where you need with the oil, exactly is the time, but I lost two or three oil pans learning how to do that, because the, the oil pan hits the part and it goes flying. Okay. This is um, a lifeboat certificate I, I learned, I earned when I was at a Sheepset Bay, saying that I was proficient in launching and manning a lifeboat. Now, manning a lifeboat at sea is one thing. Uh, if a ship is going, it's another. In rough waters, it's another thing. It's a very, uh, it's not a tough job, but you have to know what you're doing. And you have to have the experience to launch a lifeboat. Um, if a ship is, has any motion at all, if a ship is torpedoed, it doesn't stop, so it has forward motion. And so you have to learn how to launch the lifeboat while the ship is in motion. And that's a, a very uh, very important job. Thank you. I could be a messman. See that? I could be a messman. I could serve the food in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the sewer department. And then on the, ne on the next page, I got several endorsements. Uh, I could do various jobs, become an ordinary seaman there. And then down here, the last one, I became a, a cadet for the United States Merchant Marine Cadet Corps. I uh, saw this advertisement after I joined the academy. And this is a picture of a cadet midshipman reporting aboard ship on a, any kind of a ship and greeted by an engineer or deck officer. Anybody know who that is? Humphrey Bogart. Humphrey Bogart. That's from the picture Action in the North Atlantic. And he never, he never welcomed me aboard ship. <laughs> <laughs> when I got to King's Point, they were still building the, the academy. A beautiful stone buildings and everything. But I had to live in the CCC barracks. Some of you might remember what the CCC barracks were. And the CCC project, the world of uh, prior war. And uh, thank goodness, I got out of this and into the stone building before, before, uh, before winter, and actually I left the academy in, in November to go to sea. This is my company at King's Point. I was in the 11th, 11th company, and I'm way in the back there. I was short for my class, believe it or not. This is a, a list of all, of all the Liberty Ship contractors in the, in the whole country. There's 19, 18 or 19 of them, and that shows how many ships were produced. Right here in New England, uh, Portland and Seaford, they, they produced a lot of ships. 2,710 Liberty ships were launched. The first one took, I think, 100, 200 days to build. Then they built them in an average of, well, 43 days was the average after that. That's a picture of a Liberty ship up in the North Atlantic. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That was taken by, by a British escort vessel. And it just shows you riding over a wave, and that's not fun. 
What do you mean? In 1940, the British uh, requested the United States to build 60 ships for their virtual marine. And these ships were going to be of the design of the British, which were scotch boilers and a reciprocating engine and burning coal. And so we had to build two shipyards to make these ships for the British. And that's one thing we did. We just if you need a, a shipyard, go build one. You know, what's the difference? It's not hard to build a shipyard. The Americans decided, we decided, that we needed more ships. And so they took the, took the British design, modified it immensely, and came out with a new ship, and they started producing a new ship. And they built new shipyards. Nine new shipyards were built from scratch. I told you earlier that we decided to build the C1, C2, and C3 ships. Well, they were fine, except that they had reduction gears, and they were very expensive and very costly and timely to build those engines. They had to have a ship and an engine that they could build very fast, and that's why the Liberty Ship Engine uh, came about. Uh, it was an English, uh, English design, and uh, it worked wonderful. It was able to, they were able to build them, and I don't know how they can build them so fast, but anyway, they could build them uh, much, much faster than they could reduction gears. That's our Liberty Ship going to sea. has torpedo nets around it. It slowed the ship down so much that it was impractical. So they didn't do it as a, oh, that's a picture of a Navy Liberty ship. This is a one slip away in one shipyard. Now I want you to notice, right here, that's a track, one track. Over here is the other track. Now that track is for that, oh, that, that track supports this monster here and that's called a, 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 a real railroad can go right beneath it. See the tracks of the real railroad right here? So the rail, if they need the supplies down at the other end of the pier, the train could ride right down underneath that gantry train, gantry crane, and go down to the other end of the pier and, and do the supplies. So you can see, the big cranes like this, you'd think it would stop them from moving. It didn't stop them at all. They could still you still move back and forth, and that crane had a tremendous list, so they could put stuff from there all the way down into the bottom of the ship if they had to. Here's another gantry train right here. Uh, but it shows you, and that's a Liberty ship getting ready to be launched. But it shows you the side. Now, the Sun ship building up in Sun, uh, Chester, Pennsylvania had 23 slipways. Imagine, 20 of these side by side. They took a half a mile. Liberty ships that have been launched, and these two here are, are cargo ships, but the other seven are tankers. Now, the, the tankers were being sunk so fast by the Germans, if they had a choice of two ships, a cargo ship or a tanker, they'd take the tanker any time. And so, they started to make Liberty ships as tankers so they would be uh, ignored, so to speak. Sometimes they were ignored and sometimes they weren't. If there was only one ship to be going after, they'd go after it. But if there was a choice between a tanker and a Liberty ship, they'd go after the Liberty ship. Now this is another Liberty ship being launched. And all this wood here is what they call a, a poppet. They build it underneath the, the bow of the, the ship. So as the ship is being launched, the stern of the ship is being supported by water out in the, where it was being launched into. But the bow of the ship doesn't have any support at all. And so it's resting on this great humongous structure called the poppet. And as it goes in, the ship just crushes the poppet, as you can see here. And that's like a cushion for the bow as it hits it before it hits the water. Down in New Orleans, they built the ships on the side of a river. There's not enough room to launch the ship because it takes a lot of mo a lot of room to launch it into the into a big area. But then you launch them sideways. Imagine being on the other side and get that weight. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> if you look down at the bottom, I think that's one convoy lost 26 ships. Is that 26 or 27? 21 ships in a total. Another convoy lost so many. And you go all the way up the line. Here's one here. Let's 
Two convoys lost 11 ships for a total of 22. You go all the way up the chart, 25 convoys lost one. But if you look up at the top, two convoys lost 26 ships each. In 1939, we only had four, uh, four shipyards that could make tankers, and they were making them mostly for supporting oil. But they did design the T2 can tanker and Sun Shipyard. Sun Shipyard built uh, 200 and some odd tankers, launching tankers all the time. And uh, now the tanker. <laughs> oh, they. Um, when they built the nine emergency, the, the nine emergency yards that I told you about, the emergency shipyards, three of them were devoted to strictly tankers. And you had uh, one in Kaiser out in Oregon, one in Alabama dry dock, and one in the Martin Ship Company down in the Gulf. And the Kaiser yard built 147 tankers. Alabama grew 102 and Martin Ship uh, built 43. Uh, the ship itself is 503 feet long, carried six million gallons of gasoline, uh, and the engines for the for the T2 tanker were built in three locations: General Electric in Lynn, Mass, uh, the other company in Genet, Pennsylvania, and Westinghouse, uh, also in Pennsylvania. And so they built during the war 527 tankers. Now my ship. The Gaines Mill, that's not the Gaines Mill, it's just the tanker. Um, it, was, it was laid down, the first, the first part of the, the first bilge plate, the first uh, keel, was laid down in July uh, 1943. By October it was launched, and it was delivered to the customer on July 23rd, and I reported aboard either the latter part of that month or the first first in November. On this tanker, those are airplanes. So after loading up with oil, taking us down with this much freeboard right here, and right through here, you have a, super, a, a structure that supported these airplanes. And we carried every trip across the North Atlantic, we carried about 15 fighter planes on the deck. So we were a good target. We had the gasoline to run the planes and we had the plane. And that's a ship that's loaded with airplanes on the deck. You see the airplanes on the deck? But it has no oil cargo. If it had oil cargo, it would be way down in the water. How the planes would look on the deck. But that's not a deck of a tanker there, that's a lighter. But the, when they get on the, on the on a tanker, they would look the same way. This is the Gaines Mill where I was on, the ship I was on. After a bad storm up in the North Atlantic, we lost our two life rafts here. There's one, it's gone. The other one is gone. And behind it is the lifeboat. Now the lifeboat, normally when we went to sea, we put the lifeboats over the side to be ready to be dropped. And they had to be, we had to be ready to drop it fast. But that, this, after the storm, we hadn't got it out over, over the side yet. And you can see how, you see the flag up there, how stiff it is. And this is the structure, all of the structures where they mounted the, the ships. And this right here is the catwalk that we walked between uh, the engine room back there and the bridge house where I lived. But these are all the trips I took on my ship. 83,000 miles in one year's time, 88,000 miles in one year's time. We were going all the time. Uh, it took us three, three uh, days to load and unload, and the rest of the time we were at sea. A cargo ship is two or three weeks to load, two or three weeks to unload, but we could be to our destination and back before the Liberty ship leaves port. That's why we had traveled so so far in such a short time. And this story, this ship has a story to tell. It was it was built as a, a deluxe passenger ship to carry people on uh, cruises, and uh, it, it was a small ship. It wasn't a monster ship. Converted to an army transport. It was on a, a trip from uh, Greenland uh, up to, they were going from St. John's, Nova Scotia, 
and they were about 150 miles off of the port, and they were torpedo. Now they had, there were three merchant ships and three escorts, and uh, the, the, the submarine skipper was able to pick the pick the Dorchester out of the mob, out of the, the three out of the ships and sink it. And the four chaplains, which is uh, a wonderful story, uh, or the passengers, all the, the troops on board, there were 700 and some odd troops, they were told to keep their life jackets on all the time. But you know, they didn't want to wear them because they were uncomfortable. You couldn't sleep with them, so they didn't sleep with them. So after the ship was torpedoed in the engine room, all the lights went out and they were all looking for their life jackets and they couldn't find their life jackets. These four chaplains had life jackets on. They took the life jackets off and gave them to soldiers and they went down with the ship. And that's a sad story. The captain, the armed guard officer, and the radio officer were invited to, to not invite or told, ordered to go to a, a meeting in, uh, in, in New York in my case and uh, to the district office where they monitored uh, convoys and they get the information of what convoy they were going to be in, how fast they had to go, their position in the convoy, whether it's a line or a column, a line or a, a position in the column, and uh, uh, in the destination, uh, in sealed orders. Uh, and that, those are the only three people who knew where the, where the ship was going when it left port. Anybody else? No seaman knew where we were going. Uh, and when you were assigned to a ship, you knew nothing about anything. You were you were dumped over. <laughs> you uh, you weren't. Cause they figured that the word got out, and it may be the Dorchester going down was a case of the Germans knowing where the Dorchester was going to be. That could have been loose lips sink ships. I don't say it was, but it very well could have been. 609 convoys had 30,000 ships. This is. This is just a, a, an ad. And then uh, 242 ships were sunk in those convoys. 84 were sunk as a straggler. Now my ship was a straggler one time, and it's not fun. Uh, the convoy leaves you, and you're sitting out there all alone trying to fix your boilers, in my case. And uh, they got the boiler fixed, and we went, uh, so to speak, flying speed to catch up to the convoy. And we were without the convoy for several hours, and it was not fun being out there alone. Now, the transatlantic convoys, of the 206 ships, none damaged in 1943 and 4. Now these were fast convoys. And the other one is, uh, those are fast convoys too. And uh, from Curacao, we go to Curacao to pick up gasoline. Uh, 192 ships and two were sunk in convoys, one sunk in the straggler. Tanker convoy, you can tell the, the tanker by its silhouette. And it's different from all other kinds of ships. Tanker there, they all look the same. Convoys up in the North Atlantic, the ships are about two and a half lengths apart. You're, dry, you're sailing your ship with no lights, no radar. It's stormy. And you have to see the ship, and the seamanship had to be incredible with all these convoys and not many, many collisions. We had one in our, one convoy where two ships combined, uh, collided, a terrible fire, and one of the ships was a tanker. Imagine driving down a highway, three car lengths in front of the car in front of you with no lights in the dark rainy night. Would you do it? I don't know if you would. And yet the ships had to do that. Between the captain and the chief engineer, there was this little slip of paper. And on this slip of paper, it says New York to Liverpool. It took us 10 days and six hours to get there. We went 3,700 miles by engine, 3,800 miles by observation. And we had a slip of the engine of 3.5. That means that the power wasn't doing work like it should have for only 3.5%, which is not bad. Down here, you burned, uh, boy, I can't read the, the barrels of oil per, per mile. This is a trip from Avonmouth 
up to Liverpool, and you see the slip is minus seven. That means we were with a following sea or a following current. So the ship was going faster than the engines could make it go. See, the engines only went 264 miles, but actually we went 296. And there again, we burned um, the fuel consumption way down here is 65. 0.65 barrels per mile. This shows me. Coming home from Liverpool, my first trip, took us 14 days to come home. It only took us 10 days to cross. We went 4,306 4, miles by engine, but by observation, you know, we went 3,400. Our slip was 19.7%, which shows that we were really going against the wind and the waves for the whole trip. And this is a present I got from Truman when I got home. <laughs> Mr. Truman thanked me for my service. That was it. We got no GI Bill. We got nothing. If a merchant seaman was uh, torpedoed and he lost his ship, he didn't get paid anymore. He wasn't on. He wasn't on a monthly salary. He didn't lose. He lost everything. Uh, if we were in New York, uh, picking up uh, in the Hudson River, waiting to get our airplane cargo. Uh, Boats would come out, relieve, take the armed guard off. But if the boat came out, we, as merchant marines, we had to pay extra to get a ride ashore. So it was that kind of thing. Uh, we were not welcome in the OS. So that's my story, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Too late to do any good. I couldn't get the GI Bill. I couldn't get the. I couldn't get the mortgage on my house. I started the job with two other fellows who were active army, and they got. They started at thirty-two dollars a week, and I started at thirty. I couldn't start at thirty because I didn't. I wasn't army. I wasn't military, so to speak. Well, so I had a head that behind me all the time. Two dollars less than everybody else. Well, the good thing is that Congress is supposed to give you a thousand dollars a month just as to make up for it. Don't hold your breath. Oh well, <laughs> my my idea. My father was an emergency marine. What do you mean? You, my idea know. is that they're waiting for all of you to pass on before they give you the thousand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's about the size of it. I don't mind the money. I don't. I don't. I'm not looking for the money. I yeah. really am not. But I do think they should be recognized. Yeah. You had the worst casualties. They should have recognized. I got the same as a Annapolis. As cadets, we received sixty dollars uh, a month. And uh, I got a bonus when I went out in danger water. Uh, but then the, the danger got less and less, so the bonuses got less and less. But the, the, the idea of uh, better pay for the merchant marines than the military, they compared a chief pay officer to the Navy for a, a bosun for the, for the merchant marine, and the Navy got more. Because he got he got paid for his he got help for his wife he got clothing benefits he got he got all kinds of benefits for his merchant and, he, and if he's off the ship he's still getting paid merchant marine is off the ship he gets nothing so in the long run the navy active duty did better than merchant marine however over in England the merchant marine is topped off they're they're really treated treated as well as the armed forces. Man for man. Anybody see the movie Dunkirk? Say about that. Okay. Uh, it, there's only been one copy of Dunkirk, right? Yes. The true heroism of Dunkirk is the thousands and thousands of little boats that went from England over to your, over to Dunkirk to receive, re relieve, take off 200 and some odd thousand soldiers. Now the, the whole picture, most of the picture is showing the raids on two ships and a lot of people were killed, which was terrible. I mean, it, it really was terrible. But the real, the real story of Dunkirk is the, the little boats that did the job, that got the 200,000 people off, in my opinion. We are grateful for this. Round of applause.